Ah, YouTube, internet, space, time, madness. What's up, people? I am Taylor. It is April 20th, 420, bruh. Uh, 2022, at least when I'm recording this. I don't know when the hell you're watching it. I'm not in the control of you. But this is the Cranky Comic Book Review Show. I feel like I need to yell when I'm saying that or, you know, have a catchphrase or something like, let's get cranked. I have none of those things. Um, I'm just going to talk about this week's comics, worst to best. Kind of like always, if you like what I'm doing, please hit the subscribe bell, hit the notification, hit all that crap. You know, all the YouTube stuff. All the stuff, people. Hit it. If not, you don't have to hit it. It's fine. I'll live. I'll just cry myself to sleep tonight in my giant pillow. But I'll live! Um, it was kind of a slow week for comics. <laughs> really. The past couple have been slow. It's better than last week. Last week was hot garbage for comics. This week, there are a few I really liked, and some I really didn't. So let's get into it. Uh, the, we're going to start with a, a book from Behemoth Press called Dark Beach. <sighs> okay, I try and pick up a lot of first issues. Uh, and, and I try and pick up whatever indie stuff I can kind of grab. My, my LCSs are not great at stocking. Like, indie, indie, indie books if that makes sense, they'll get some of the smaller stuff and they'll get like what they think sells, which makes sense, but they don't carry truly any. So I don't have a, a vehicle that's easy for me to like grab like uh, really out there stuff. Uh, and I appreciate when like they like companies like Behemoth offer like what maybe are new writers, new chances and stuff and give them an idea, give them a, like a, a, a somewhere to express their ideas. That said, I did not care for this book very much. Um, I didn't think the art was very well polished or worked too well. Um, the story itself, there just isn't much of one. Uh, this is the far future. The sun's killing us, and they like are setting up a factory of like other artificial suns, and there's people that are still addicted to sun things, and there's a murder. That's kind of about it. Um, and, and you had to piece that together through reading it. It's not really well described or well plotted out in here there's a main character whose motivations are kind of unclear who like maybe works for a newspaper in the future or whatever replaces a newspaper i think or gets photos for the thing which is weird because it's still kind of old technology and it seems like nothing else has progressed in the future other than that the lights have gone out in georgia or the light was killing us i don't know it's a it's kind of an unclear book the art doesn't really help clarify things there's some panels that are fine uh but then there's just kind of some like really stiff kind of clunkiness to the artwork that i didn't care for i i mean i i don't try not to be giant jackass on some of these smaller books i really am uh because i do like like i like some of the ideas behind this i like some of the thoughts but i just don't think it worked as on the whole as a book um i probably won't be finishing this one but i wanted to give it a first issue shot now secondly when we're talking about Marvel but mainstream books, I'm going to be more critical because holy hell. <laughs> we get the whole the spoiler cover. Spoiler. Look, I spoiled it all for you. It's the first appearance of Titan, and this is a goddamn stupid book. I don't. I hated Otley's art in this. I, know, I liked him in other stuff, and I really, really, really hate what Donny Cates is doing with this. I read issue one and skipped everything up until now because like, issue one just made me want to like vomit. And issue six is not any fucking better. This is a bad book. And, and I, I think it might be just Donnie Cates really trolling the fans here and seeing what the dumbest idea he can get away with is before Marvel says, no, that's way too fucking stupid to print. We're getting there. I mean, they're, they're still like the weird Bruce Banner piloting the Hulk as a mindless beast. But then there's some revelations in here. There's this reveal, whatever the hell the Titan is, which is just, it's stupid. Everything about this is dumb and not in a fun, good comic book way dumb. It is just dumb. This is, this just angers me. <laughs> like the fact that mainstream comics have put this crap out and like the people suck it up. And I'm guilty of this. I bought a couple copies of this because the solicits and key collector and all those people they are like, Oh my God, it's the first appearance and first cover appearance and spoiler appearance. And like, I didn't buy 45 copies like some people, but I, I, I spent a few. So if you want to buy these for $400 on goddamn eBay or whatnot, you let me know. Cause I'll happily sell them. Cause this is it's just it's idiotic. All right, next. Um, yeah. All right. Indie book. I'm trying. I'm trying to be nice. I'm trying to be nice. We Live the Palladians, issue number two. I loved the first volume of We Live. 
uh, by the Miranda Brothers. I thought it was a great story. It was one of my top picks of last year. It told a pretty straightforward story that had a lot of twists and turns, but it was a straightforward narrative of, of a quest of this young kid to get to a spaceship, basically. Uh, there were a lot of twists along the way and, like, you know, revelations and all that. Then the story jumps ahead in the future, and now we are in, we live the age of the Palladians. Or Palladians? I don't know. I don't know how the hell you say it. Uh, they had two issues, number one. I didn't care for either of them. This is better than those, but it's still not. It seems like they've lost their way to tell a story. It, like, it jumps all over the place here, and, like, the big reveals are just kind of like told in little panels and then the other panels are dedicated to other stuff. Uh, the fight scenes are confusing as all hell. There's not really a, it's a jumbled mess. Uh, and when the, the original story was like, it was all clear and great and gorgeous. It just kind of, I don't know, like there's something about this. It just really does not work for me in this, this run. I will keep it up. I keep hoping that they'll like, that'll come together and just tell a cohesive story and tell it in a linear path. I don't think they're going to do that. I think they're going to keep jumping around and stuff. And I think they're going to have multiple narratives that just, I don't know. It's just muddy storytelling. Like it, it's just not, and I, I get you need to, you know, you want to have some mystery as to what's going on. I get that. I, mean, I get that. But you also have to give the reader a path forward. That's like interesting for them. And there's just not a lot of interest here. Even visually, like it's lost a step, I think. And, uh, I don't know. It's it's my disappointment of the of the year thus far because I was really looking forward to it, and it just it's not doing it for me. I don't know. Like I'll keep it up. I think there's like what four or five issues, and like we'll see. But it just really is not grabbing me like that first volume. It's really I don't know. It's a letdown. All right. Uh, next, and we're getting kind of in the the sort of better stuff now. I mean, it was not an awful week really, but uh, we have World's Finest number two. Mark Wade on the writing and uh, Dan Moore on the art. I love Dan Moore's art. I think it's great. I like the coloring. It's got my favorite team, the Doom Patrol from DC with the original cast. And this is just kind of a throwback book to the old kind of World's Finest. Except for the way the World's Finest tended to work as like one and done stories. And this is like a longer narrative. So Dan, so Mark Wade is getting a chance to like tell a bit longer story. And the thing with White Wade is like he's a good, solid writer. He's not going to probably shake the heavens and earth and like come up with something groundbreaking and new or like disrupt the status quo or do anything like that. But he knows how to tell a solid story. And that's what this is. It's a solid story. Um, you know, there's like, it carries over from issue one and like you learn some stuff and there's reveals and it's like got all the pacing right and the beats right. It's just, it's not that exciting. It's like middle of the ground. Good. And that's sometimes all you can ask for out of a comic, especially when you come from DC and Marvel. You're just going to get middle of the ground good from them. You're not going to get everything being great because they just pump out such a volume of crap at every at both those companies uh, that, <laughs> that honestly middle of the ground good is usually pretty good for them. And so this is pretty good for them. It's, it's you know, it's got the Doom Patrol. It's got Superman and Batman. It's got shenanigans and stuff and quippy banter. And it's a throwback to a kinder, gentler era. It's all right. All right, here we go. Ah, uh, DC again. Nightwing number whatever this is, 91. Uh, Tom Taylor on the art. Nightwing is still great. I really miss, uh, Redondo, miss Redondo's art. This issue, like, the art just uh, took a step back with uh, Borges on it as a fill-in artist. Uh, it's pairing up with Nightwing and Wally West. You don't even get... Look, you get one cheek of each booty here. Gee, well, it's like the... It's like together they form a solid booty. It's a lighthearted-ish romp of people that are trying to kill Nightwing. I mean, it, it kind of is like Tom Taylor's taking a pretty light tone to this, even though it's fairly serious subject matter. Um, and he, like, it's it's a fun story, and and like this is sort of like the Wall the Wally and Beaver show. Not really. That's that's way too old for even my audience. But the it's you get the Wally West, you get the Nightwing, and like they're just like chumming it up like old days, and like you find out that Wally's been keeping eyes on him, and like you know just really wants to make sure Nightwing stays alive, and it's gentle and light. And then there's a bunch of assassins. So it's decent. It's not. It's like not my favorite one. I I do think it's much better when Bruno Redondo's on the art. But again, it's pretty good. All right. Um. Next, we have Nice House on the Lake number eight. This needs to start going somewhere. The art is great. Like, um, Alvaro Martinez Bueno is doing a fantastic job on the art. My Jordi Belair's colors are ridiculously good. James Tynan the fourth is pacing this glacially slow. Like, I don't do, I feel that this probably needed to be a 12-issue maxi-series. I think it probably could have just been 
a six issue thing and it's fine. But he's got this like idea of like peeling off the tiny onion. That, get it? Because his last name tiny onion. They have the tiny onion website. Uh, clever people. Clever. No, it's just like there's this end of the world ish kind of the weird ass mystery going on here. But like, and like, the, you know, the way he sets it up at the end of each issue, there's a little bit of a reveal. And the end of this issue is a little bit of a possible reveal. But like, well, there's only four issues to go. And like, it doesn't seem like it's progressed very far. In fact, like, it, you know, if you're in, I'm not one to spoil it, but it sort of progressed, then it reset. And now it's kind of like more slowly progressing again and it's feeling like, like a bit of a reach red. I still like it. I still want to see where it ends up. But I just think that the pacing needs to pick up. Like, and like, it, and it needs to kind of pick up quickly or it's going to have a really sudden jarring ending or that's just going to like flop and not work. Because I don't, I don't, I think there's something off with that. I think like... You can have a grand reveal at the end, but like it, when when the rest of this has just been such a slow, methodical crawl, I don't know. It feels like the crawl has to go somewhere. So, all right, all right. Next, we have Black Hammer Reborn issue number eleven. This is the or penultimate issue. I love that word, penultimate. Uh, this is where everything changes but remains the same. <laughs> kind of. There's one issue to go. I don't know how the hell they're gonna wrap this up either. This might be another one where the ending doesn't quite stick it for me because like they did, what they reveal in this one is like. Well, that kind of a shocker. Um, Jeff Lemire in the writing, Caitlin Yarsky in the art, Dave Stewart of the colors. And uh, yeah, this kind of ties it all back into the original Black Hammer run, which is one of the greatest superhero runs in recent memory for me, setting up its own universe. And it's one of the better issues of this run. I wasn't 100% loving Black Hammer Reborn, but I like what's going on here. Um, you, you learn some stuff about the farm. You learn some stuff about the original stuff. You learn kind of what happened after the end of the original Black Hammer. Uh, and you like, you kind of learn what happened to a couple of characters a couple issues ago. And I'm hoping they managed that Lemire managed to stick the landing on the next one. Um, clean, solid art by Yarsky. Uh, not quite at the level of Dean Armstrong from the original run, but I think that's not, I don't think anyone's going to reach those heights, but it's really a pretty decent, decent book. I really like fine plus right now. So that like camera reborn. Um, uh, at this rate, just wait it out and get the, the giant volume when they release it of all 12 issues. Because it's, you know, we're one away from the ending on this one, people. One away. And I think there's going to be another mini-series or maxi-series or whatever. Six issues coming early next year or the end of this year. And I think that's kind of it for Black Hammer for a bit. Uh, because, yeah, I think, uh, like, uh, Jeff Lemire's going to be working on his Substack stuff. And like, he's got an exclusive with Image now, I think. Not sure. It doesn't matter. But uh, it's not really relevant to this review. But, yeah, Black Hammer Reborn, one of the better issues of this run. Okay, we got a couple left. This one actually came out a couple weeks ago, but like my LCS just got in this week because I guess there's all damaged or back order or paper or life or COVID or who the hell knows. Heavy Metal Jumper number three, also from Behemoth Press. Um, this is a trippy ass, weird underground space sci fi murdering prostitute cat hating book. With a heavy metal drummer who hasn't done any drumming. He did a little bit of a drummer in the first issue, but now he's off to save the world by having sex with prostitutes to cut their head off. It's a weird one. It's it's not going to be for everybody. I love the art. I love the weird kind of clunkiness of this art. It's And I love the bizarre-ass story. I mean, it kind of reminds me of They Live from the... Uh, John Carpenter's They Live on Acid. It's just a nuts book. Um, again, you can probably wait till this is collected. I think there's only like one or two left in this. I think it's probably a... I think this is issue number three. I think it's like a five-issue thing. Maybe six. Um, but it's bizarre... It's fun. It it's you know bright and and goofy and kind of dark all at the same time, and it's not going to be for everybody. But I'm having a lot of fun with it. All right. Speaking of books that are not for everybody, speaking of books that are definitely dark and gritty and grim, we have Crimson Cage, the last issue. This is five of five. Um, we got John Lee's and Alex on the writing, Alex Cormick on the art. On uh, Ashley Cormick, I think, on the coloring is my guess. I, I, I could open it up and see, but it's already taped up, people. Uh, this is the end. This is the wrap-up of this. This is like, and the, if you're not familiar with this, this is an AWA Upshot book, and it's basically pro wrestling meets Macbeth. And this is the end of the Macbeth story, and it ends kind of like Macbeth does. It's I don't want to spoil it, but if you've ever read the 100-year-old play or watched, uh, several 100-year-old play and watched it or whatever, you're kind of going to get it. Um, it all comes crashing down because Shakespeare did not love happy endings for a lot of folks. And uh, yeah, this is not necessarily a happy ending. But it's gorgeous. It's gritty. It's it's fun. All I mean, it's a little fun. It's, it's mostly more grim and gritty than fun. But I love Cormac's art, and I like John Lee's writing. Um, it's just kind of an insane idea that probably shouldn't work, but I really think it did. I would recommend getting it in the trade. 
because it's done now. I mean, you can hunt down the original issues probably pretty cheaply. But uh, yeah, Crimson Cage has been great. It's been my book of the week uh, several times over. It came close to making it this week, but eh, yeah, there's another one, one more left that I like better. So yes, Crimson Cage number five. Dun, dun, dun. And finally, last and definitely not least, we have Ice Cream Man issue number 30. Oh, no, 29. Sorry, 29. He said 30th anniversary of Image, and I just read the number 30 and I blurted it out without even really realizing the content. But yeah, this um, is the last will and testament of Will Parsons, a writer. And uh, it's what he leaves behind when he dies. And if it and it's Ice Cream Man. And Ice Cream Man reads the will and testament, and uh, everyone gets something. It's a kind of a melancholy uh, essay on life and like what's le left at the end of it all. And like what's left for people that loved you. Um, and like what, what's left out of a, a mission of life and what, uh, what means things in life and what matters. And, uh, it's, it's not one of the more horror oriented stories in this. Um, this, this book's been taken, it's been, it's, it's, it's totally different from each issue to issue, but it's always Maxwell Prince and, uh, Morazzo on the art, um, Maxwell Prince on the writing. And it, it this is, yeah, I mean, it, this creepiness on this cover probably doesn't do this one justice, but it's a, it's a great kind of sad little story. But at the same time, it's a little bit hopeful because you, like, you kind of learn that what's left is what people think of you. And like, and there's a squid. There's a squid. And some shoes. I don't, I don't want to spoil this one, but if you're not reading Ice Cream Man, it's an anthology series. You can pick up pretty much any issue and it'll be a stand on, standalone on its own. There'll be the sort of like overarching idea of the Ice Cream Man that like shows up in each one of these, each issue a little bit. So you don't have, you know, but you don't need to know some of that. It's sort of like watching the horror movie that used to be on late at night. With, with, like, Elvira. She didn't really have shit to do with the movies. But, like, you know, she kind of tied it all together with her personality. So, yeah, Ice Cream Man number 30. Or 29. Jesus. I keep doing that. It's my favorite book this week. Um, it's been solid since I started picking it up. I need to read, like, the first 20. I got I jumped on the bandwagon very late on this. But it's an anthology. So I can just grab anthologies and trades and, you know, can do it that way. I'm not going to probably be able to afford the first one. It's kind of gotten stupidly expensive. That's okay. I can just pick it up collected. I don't need to have every book, people. Try not to have the FOMO, because YOLO. And what you leave behind matters. Look, I tied it all together at the end. How do you like that? Pull that one right out of my ass. All right. That's all I've got. Um, I, yeah, I'm going to get out of here. Hope everyone has a good week. And if you get high, get high today, because it's 420. I'll see you. And uh, yeah, don't be a dick, even if you don't get high. <laughs> that's, that's not my best. Don't be a dick line, but I'm going with it. Later.